friends, here we are with another episode of the Power of Nine podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Eggert. Today's guest has taken his experience in politics and tech to create a software that is the glue between agencies tasked to make our food supply safer and more resilient. I am excited to share with you the journey of my friend, Eric Hoffman. Eric, welcome to the show. Nice to have you. It's nice to see you and yeah, yeah. be on the show. Yeah, thanks, man. So uh, I'm pumped about this because anybody who's watching this on YouTube, this is my first uh, session that we're doing from the Maple in Excelsior. You live in Stillwater. Right. So this was a haul. No, it's not a problem. This is an amazing space. It's so crazy, excited right? for you. Yeah, I know. It's so neat. I know. So this is just a little glimpse into what this place is like, but it's basically like this little entrepreneur setup for like co-working for entrepreneurs in the middle of nowhere right. uh, Excelsior. It's, it's so got a cool. very Excelsior flair to it yeah, though, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was it like even walking up to this place when you when you came up? Were you like, what the hell am I going well, into? I was like, what is happening here? Like this is amazing. <laughs> it's like no signs, like I'm going to a cool place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that was <laughs> just the insiders know. That's the vibe, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, good. Yeah. So and it aligns with me and my my jam and and you know, I think, you know, I appreciate you coming out and and spending some time one on one with me right. and being the first person to do this in person. I'm, I'm honored. I know. And you've got a background in, in uh, a little bit of broadcast stuff. So we're yeah. going to dig into that. Yeah. Um, so I like to just kind of talk about your journey. And okay. so I want to, um, you're a Minnesota guy, right? Like you oh, grew yeah, up born here? and bred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And Whole I, family. Right. And I think you're a huge, you're a huge sports fan. It's like Minnesota sports, right? I've done a lot with sports and, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. around sports. Yeah, yeah. So. Were you, uh, was sports a big part of your, your upbringing? Uh, yeah, the old story was I wanted to play hockey, and Dad said, I don't know about that, so I played soccer. Um, was a goalie, the most expensive position I could find. Yeah, right. Just to, yeah. <laughs> just to stick yeah, it yeah. to him. I'm kidding. But, but the, soccer was a big thing growing up. I refed, I coached, I've done a lot of things. Did you play sports. goalie in soccer too? Oh, yeah. You 100%. did? Do you think it takes like a, I feel like the people that I know that are goalies, it just is a different, they have just different brains. We have a different approach, I think, to life a little bit. Right, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you have to want to be in the spotlight, and you want to have to be the... The dog. Yeah, totally. When things go bad. Yeah. Right. What uh, What was your family dynamic growing up? Um, just uh, my mom and dad were, my dad worked for City Hall. He was the director of public works for the city of Edina. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff around city and, and those kind of activities my mom taught. Mm -hmm. And I just had just my sister. So it was me and her and growing up in the south suburbs. What is the, how, what's the age difference between you and your sister? Two and a half years. Oh, so pretty so, tight. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm the oldest, blazed the trail. Yeah, like, yeah. Like everybody else talks about. And right. she just kind of brought up the rear garden, got away with murder. <laughs> right. Uh, she did get away with murder. Well, that's how I see it. Yeah, right, right. That's one <laughs> She time, says right. you shouldn't have done the things you did. So it's just how you look at things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so sports were a big part of your upbringing. Anything else that you were into? Oh, I, I was... I was over-involved, so I was in speech, I was in radio, mm -hmm. I was on the theater, I was on sports, church-involved activities, mm -hmm. band. I did way too many things. What well, it was, <laughs> so radio, when you're in your, you know, like, let's say high school, even, yeah. even, you know, you, well, probably high school, what is that, what is that? Um, so they, our high school had a radio station, oh, cool. and so we were able to, I had a lunch show, and then I had a drive timer between yeah. class uh, show as well. Huh some groups so over the years we got to have a where we wanted to do on the lunch show and then the afternoon was news and announcements and some bumper music what did you classes. like what made you want to get into all that i just you know i i don't mind the stage like a goalie right i don't mind being out there yeah, right. and i don't mind trying something new like when yeah. i did this speech team they said well you, you talk a lot so maybe you should do that yeah i said oh, let's go do extemporaneous speech that's cool um so i, I just liked trying new things in high school i didn't really know what I wanted to do specifically um, until about junior, senior year where I really wanted to do psychology, you know, mm -hmm. in college. Mm -hmm. Focus on that, but I wanted to try all these things. I wanted to understand people's experiences and understand their worldview and I wanted to kind of know more than I knew Yeah. because I grew up in a, you know, a nuclear family and we had our view of the world and that's not the only world. One time one kid said to me in school, you know, I want to try everything I can try. Yeah. I want to experience everything there is to experience in life. That just kind of resonated with me and I don't know, that just kind of stuck with me. Like, it would be really great not to stick in one track, but try multiple. Were you a good student? I was a capable student. <laughs> I saw so was I. Right, yeah. Right. No, that I doesn't a, mean that I was any good. I was a good student up through high school. I started doing so many activities. And yeah, I, you know, A's and B's. It wasn't bad stuff. Yeah. But uh, I feel like high school was uh, really did encourage people to do extracurricular activities and be really involved in other things. Yeah, so yeah. that was a nice balance for our school growing up. So you didn't come, you know, we always talk about nature versus nurture uh, on this show. And so I was thinking about this in advance of this recording. And so you don't really have a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in your family other no. than 
maybe entrepreneurial, like some of the work that people did, but they worked for somebody like the risk taker side of you is true to that goalie type mindset to where you're, you're okay being in the spotlight and you're okay, like kind of blazing that trail. Yeah. As you know, my dad was a director of public works for city of nine, as I mentioned for 30 years. Right. But before that, where I think the inkling came from is he was a pilot and now he's also a test pilot there. Oh. He took up the choppers to make sure things were running. They weren't going to fall apart uh-huh. when they went on their uh, missions to bring people out. Um, so like that, so he had some risk taken in him, even though he chose a civil career, right? You know, and I, so I think that part of that, that kind of cowboy that he yeah. had, I think that's where some of that came from, and just kind of being a little bit inspired or awed by the fact that that's a pretty risky thing to be doing and to volunteer for that, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> th- so there is that nature side. There's so a it little is a little bit, bit on the nature side of things. But we were taught to be very conservative. Don't take risks. You know, you get a job. You you follow the career path. You do things very traditionally, and that's yeah. how we were brought up. So I was kind of pulling at that thread right. about wanting to do my own thing and do my own path and not follow the traditional. <laughs> Did you, um, so w- w- was your family really pushing you to co- go to college, or was it was that like just part of the deal? It was just the expectation right. that that's what we'd all do, and that was the path in the 80s and 90s, right? You, yeah, right. You got, you got your grades set up, and you yeah. went to college, did your four years, and you had to figure out what you're going to do by the time you got to your freshman year of college. Right. Some of us knew and some of us didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, where'd you go to cool, school? Um, University of Minnesota. Yeah. And, you know, the odd thing is I wanted to do psychology pretty badly. I skipped right into 300 and 500 level classes. They allowed me to do that. Oh. So I'd written these long senior papers in high school about the uh, pharm- pharmaceutical industry yeah. and some issues with it. And so I did that. And my mom's like, well, you know, you're really good at computers, though. Remember I sent you to computer camp in sixth grade and you're so angry with me? <laughs> I love that. And here I am today. Yeah. Isn't that funny? My mom does that too. She'll talk about stuff yeah. that happened back in like was like when I was a young kid and I'm like, do you remember when I did this? Like that doesn't mean like how does right. that translate anything? So computer class right. in sixth grade does how does that even drive anything to when you're in when you're twenty? Right. And then one day I said, Oh mom, I'm doing this, I'm working it. She's like, Mm-hmm. <laughs> Told ya. I knew that about Told you. Told ya. She's yep. like, You'd be too involved with people in psychology. You care too much about your patients, mm-hmm. you wouldn't be able to disassociate and have that distance. She's like, it would have been a terrible career path for you. So my mom kind of really knew who I was. Yeah. And I really liked to get involved. Do you think that that some of the formal training that you had with psychology has applied itself well to some of the work that you do now? It does. And I I think living in the world I do with, you know, government work and different personalities out there, Mm -hmm. having the ability to kind of empathize with the different point of views and try to be that glue in between folks to get them to come together to some conclusion Um, A lot of our stuff has been about culture change. We're Mm -hmm. trying to get people to move away from paper, trying to get back into the idea of collaboratively sharing data where traditionally people Mm -hmm. hold it to themselves and don't Mm -hmm. want to let go of it. You have to navigate that. So I think having that background in psychology a bit and having the patience and the the tools you learn were helpful to me in that. And when I built the software, I thought about people first. How will they use it? Mm -hmm. How will they feel when they use it? Um, So I wasn't the IT guy that's like, I'm going to make this cool thing in the background that nobody cares about, Yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. more about how I'm going to get people to share when they don't traditionally want to. So going back to college then, did you, uh, so I'm a college dropout. I, yep. I talk about that all the time. I yep. lasted a few months. You probably lasted much longer. Did you finish mm, college? I did not. So I had the opportunity to um, work in politics. So I was going through psychology school, got a couple years in and had this opportunity and they kind of said, hey, you have a background, you know how to write. You know how to speak. You know how to do these things. And we'd like you to come in and kind of run this firm and, and help do the fundraising and some of the political advertising and manage campaigns. Yeah. I thought, well, that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it is I jumped into that and never had time to go back to the college, especially oh. with my career shift after politics. You almost didn't necessarily need it because it was a different way of doing IT. So were you like 20, 21 at that point? Or were you even I was, I was even really then? young. Yeah, really? Yeah. 2021 probably yeah doing that kind of work it was pretty amazing <laughs> what uh so, so what area of politics um so we were managed campaigns a lot we did a lot of state-based campaigns we did some national ones we did advance work for the president and so we were doing a lot of calling polling fundraising um campaign management flyers taking all these results and let the candidates know what was happening and so i got to do an experience some brand new things in that world yeah that i never thought i would i got to go to a inaugural ball Right? Crazy. Yeah, two of them. And that's like, I'm 21 years old going, what am I doing here in a yeah, no tuxedo with a badge 
that I can go anywhere I want and yeah, not no a ball. Kidding. No kidding. So it was a really great experience, but that's where I first learned that my IT skills were budding in there. And mm. um, so they gave me the opportunity to write this software program that's never been done before to work with all this data. Huh. And it helped us raise the most money ever. And so my little program was in the paper, but really? helping the caucus raise the most money ever. And I was just like, Fascinating. Huh, maybe, maybe I should do IT. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we're going to hear from a few of our community supporters because uh, I want to start to get into your career because now, obviously, we're at this inflection point here right. where things are starting to get serious. So uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, let's get back with Eric uh, in a second. If you're anything like me, you know enough to be dangerous when it comes to finance, yet need some help when things get complicated. All in One Accounting provides the right financial expertise and leadership to align with your stage of growth. From outsourced accounting and bookkeeping to strategic financial planning, the team of accounting rock stars at All in One Accounting are passionate about positively impacting the businesses and lives of their clients. You need to check them out at allinoneaccounting.com. All in One Accounting, taking our clients from financial chaos to business clarity and beyond. If you're an entrepreneur or married to one, your journey is complex. You want financial advice that impacts your whole net worth, including your business, not just stock market investments. You also want a partner that quarterbacks the relationships between the CPA, estate planner, banker, and other trusted advisors. That's where the team at eWealth Partners comes in. We love helping you and your spouse design a financial plan that aligns and empowers you. A plan that addresses your concerns, priorities, and goals tailored to reach your long-term vision. A long-term vision that is worth the pursuit today. Visit eWealthPartners.com to learn how they can help couples like you. E-Wealth Partners, holistic financial planning for entrepreneurs. Investment advisor services offered through AdvisorNet Wealth Management. E-Wealth Partners and AdvisorNet Wealth Management are not affiliated. Verseek Search and Consulting is thrilled to support Coalition 9 and this podcast, and we are just as excited to have them as a partner. Verseek is a Minnesota-based, high-performance recruiting firm that specializes in interim solutions, direct hire, and executive leadership search. Their team of experienced professionals and seasoned leaders across various areas of expertise and industries have been in your shoes. They quickly assess your whole company and identify key elements that will take your business to the next level. Your company's success hinges on the capacity of your people, and few areas of your business are more critical than your finance and accounting team. Your company success hinges on the capacity of your people. Verseek can help connect you with the talented candidates within finance and accounting, along with other areas of expertise in executive search, direct hire, and interim solutions. People are the ultimate business advantage. Find your people together with Verseek and make the best possible for your business. Learn more and contact Verseek by visiting verseek.com and following them on LinkedIn. United Healthcare is dedicated to helping people live healthier lives and making the health system work better for everyone by simplifying the healthcare experience meeting consumer health and wellness needs, and sustaining trusted relationships with care providers. UHC is continually focused on building a modern, high-performing health system via improved access, affordability, outcomes, and experiences. With a network of over 1.6 million physicians and healthcare professionals and over 6,000 hospitals, United Healthcare is dedicated to connecting employers and their employees to better health by offering quality benefits designed for affordability. For more information, visit United Healthcare at www.uhc.com. United Healthcare, helping people live healthier lives. The topic of talent is hot in organizations of any size, and I would argue none more than small to mid-sized businesses. That's why it's crucial to have a partner to help you navigate all the HR idiosyncrasies so you can focus on working on your business and not in it. Insperity is a full-service HR partner with a high-touch, high-tech platform helping owners work through challenges like employee retention, company culture, and benefits, just to name a few. Do yourself a favor and explore all they have to offer at Insperity.com. Insperity, HR that makes a difference. All right, we're back. Uh, so, so... That's you're getting back into like your journey here. So in your early twenties, there was this this I would call it like a paradigm shifting event that right. happened where you you saw that this was your, the beginning of your path, merging this background in politics, kind of like I alluded to at the beginning, with the desire around IT and tech. Right. Um. So dig into some of that stuff. Yeah, I, I think at that point I realized that politics is not the world I wanted to live in. Yeah. Right. It's a it's a very it's a very specialized world, mm-hmm. um, and me being a people person, treating everybody like numbers was very hard. Mm-hmm. But solving problems and making sure that we could use data for good mm-hmm. me- meant something to me, right? But I knew that having left college, now mm-hmm. leaving politics, mm-hmm. huh, now what? Yeah. <laughs> like, how do I get into IT? How do I 
how we do that without the paper. And yeah. back then it was a little bit tougher. Nowadays they say you don't need a degree to be IT, which is truthful. But back then it was you're still reading books. Google wasn't right. just nascent at that point, right? right. Trying yeah. to figure out how to do things. So it's a lot of just okay. So survival mode. What mm. do I do now? Um, and this is 1996, 1997, huh. right? So. Yeah. It wasn't all the Facebook and the friends and LinkedIn and all these professional networking resources. Right, right. So then, um, did you feel like you, was it a pretty pretty lonely feeling like at that point? Because you were you were young, right? Like yeah. you're still in your twenties, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, you're sitting there, and, and and the person I was with at the time, she was going through finish her degree, was going to graduate school, and mm-hmm. doing this all these really cool things. I'm like. I don't even know who I'm going to be yet, mm-hmm. right? I don't know what my path even looks like. Mm-hmm. And so I had to try to figure out my own path because there wasn't a traditional path for somebody that dropped out of college that wanted to do IT at the time mm-hmm. that, you know, was well publicized. It was happening all over the place. Yeah. But it felt like we're all in our own pockets because you went and got your four-year comp side degree. You went and worked at a big firm. That was kind of the deal back then. And I think technology now has changed so much to where you say the term IT now, and I think it just, you know, information technology where it... But then I think there's so many people that specialize in certain things. Yes. At that time, was it just general knowledge and then you started to go down a, a specific yeah. technical path? What I wanted to do was I wanted to demonstrate to people that I was smart, that mm. I was capable. And I didn't have a job in which I could do that. So I started creating community-based things online yeah. and started growing these communities. So I did stuff in sports. Yeah. Um, so I built one of the largest NFL fan sites for the Vikings Cool. Had millions, some visitors every month, all these things. Had people flying in from other countries to our tailgate parties. And my goal there was to show that I could build tech that could scale, yeah. even in the late 90s, and that I could bring community together. So it's that early thing of I wanted to help community. I wanted yeah. to build bridges um, through technology. Yeah. And so I thought, if I can show that I could build this stuff, then I'll be attractive to somebody else. Whether I start yeah, yeah. a company or I get a job somewhere, I yeah. can point to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it was just one day after a Vikings game, my buddy says to me, you know, Purple Pride. I said, really? I should build a community around that. This is all and Red, off I went. This is Red McCombs era, right? Yeah. Like when he was young, Purple Pride? That's what he said, yeah. And I was like, I'm going to do that. So it was just funny. And the, the Vikings knew who we were, and they, you know, took care of us on some different issues and helped us out with things. And they did, huh? Yeah. Well, because they didn't have any of this. Right, And right. we were, and I was a positive voice for for the team, right? Just because I knew I didn't want to get in trouble. Yeah. No. <laughs> what did this grow to? Like, what was that? What, what What did this turn into? Well, this turned into me getting job opportunities. Sweet. Um, being able to, I went went and worked at a law firm for a while in IT because I wanted to learn help desk, learn networking. I wanted to learn the back end of all these things. The basics. Yeah, and ironically, that place I got a job at, I come to find out through an ancestry search my mom did that my relative started that firm and he came over from Ireland. What? I was working at the firm that my relative started. And we're like just dumbfounded. I, I went okay. to HR and said, hey, um, can it raise? <laughs> yeah, no, get it right. He said, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, right. You're a little bit paid those times, guy. Yeah, those right. times have changed. <laughs> so. When, uh, okay, so I just did my ancestry, ancestry stuff too. And I think all that's fascinating. We could have a whole other podcast yeah. on that. How many generations ago was that? Oh, it's started? hard to remember. It was three Three? What it might have been, but I know, yeah, he emigrated, changed the name a little bit when he got here. Yeah. Um, so it's my Irish side. That, yeah. That he, you know, when they changed the spelling, they came over. And so, yeah, it was just dumbfounded to find that. Crazy. Um, so I didn't last super long at the law firm, just out of, I wanted to do more. I wanted to manage IT. I wanted to build things. And in a law firm, that's not kind of what you're doing. So I use that as just a springboard to understand right. the world of, of information technology. So to get my timeline uh, down here, so were you doing the stuff with the Vikings and the Purple Pride thing the same time? At the as same time. You were. Okay, yeah. so that was kind of a side hustle. That was the evening and the weekends. Right. And then, you know, we bought season tickets. I started dropping flyers all around the Metrodome promoting my site. So I learned about guerrilla marketing a little bit, about how to reach out to communities. And we all these anti-packer bumper stickers yeah, with right. our logos on and stuff like that and just built audience from that sweet so then we talked about uh at the beginning like you do like this is a common thing for you sitting in front of a microphone right because of the time that you did in broadcasting outside of even just the radio that you did in high school right did that help fuel some of the stuff that you did to have your own show this this did yeah because yeah. i got a call out of the blue from a sportscaster from channel five who says hey I want to start my own show and I need some help. I heard you're the guy. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. Like, Rod, you're, I see you on Channel 5 every, yeah. every night. Yeah. He's like, yeah. But I want to like build this game on. 
I'm doing a current show of Sports Fun. I want to move it over and have our own show, and I want you to be a part of it with me, and then we'll do radio, and we'll do all these things over the years. I'm like, wow. And I think that, if I remember right, um, how old were you about that time? 27, 28. Yeah, late 20s. Okay, yeah. so I remember that kind of being like Channel 5's way to, or ABC's way to... Uh, go up against Randy Shaver and what he was doing with some of his sports specific shows, Rosen Sports Sunday, that kind of stuff. This was Rod Deal, but he partnered with you? Yeah, absolutely. And so we were on Sunday mornings on Fox before the national broadcast, and we were basically going up against PA's show and things like that. So it was a lot of fun. And he had a different take, too. He was about the community and the people behind the athletes, meaning who you are as a person away from the gridiron, where Mm -hmm. you are away from the ballpark. Mm -hmm. So I really liked the magazine-style approach of the show. It was very approachable. It melded across all audiences, could get into it, right? Yeah. Um, and he was just a wonderful guy. And we started, you know, I joined some of his charity work, you know, all these things over time. But it all started because I had this random idea, you know, that I could build some community message yeah, yeah. board stuff online. Yeah, yeah. And that helped, you know, I got to be able to do this as a you know, hobby, this TV and radio broadcasting, doing the twins on 96.3 mm-hmm. Sunday morning shows. Cool. Um, but it also helped me prove that uh, somebody could take a risk on me to build stuff. Mm-hmm. Commercially, mm-hmm. Um, for some big corporations. So. Are you doing any of that stuff anymore? Any of the like no. sports slash radio slash any of that? So long story short, um, Rod passed away when we were at spring training covering the Twins um, that, yeah. in 2017, and you know we became such close friends, and that was a part of our mm-hmm. you know DNA. And I just people ask, would you please continue? Would not please, but would you continue this? Would you mm-hmm. please honor his legacy, move it forward? I thought, no, that's not. You know, without him, yeah. that's that's not what I want to do. Yeah. And we wanted to celebrate his legacy through Golf for the Gift. So we do a charity adopt or a charity um, golf event every summer. Cool. That benefits adoption. His daughter's adopted, mm. and my goal is to get that event to be long have enough longevity that she become the executive director herself and cool. run it. Cool. Right. So we wanted to focus on that and the other charity things that Rod and I are involved, and that was a better way to kind of celebrate all those years we. You know, we went to Chicago and Soldier Field. I don't know how many times we lost every single time. Really? We went there. Then you guys went? Yeah. So you, every guys, single time. you guys were the kiss of death. It was that. our problem. <laughs> and now they're starting to win yeah, in Soldier yeah. Field again. I'm like, yeah. well, <laughs> I guess that proves Actually, it. Yeah, yeah. Right, so. Uh, so how long did you ride that wave of doing that with Rod and um, the sports site and all of that, that time in your life? Did you ride that all the way to 2017 or did you kind of back off of it prior to that? I backed off the Viking Purple Pride, that message board stuff way early on. You did? Because I had to kind of make a choice. Do I want to... You know, you're going to all the sporting events and you're tweeting and you're doing all the stuff for the show. Yeah. That kind of took up that time and I kind of handed off the Viking stuff to others. And, you know, by the time that changed, there's a lot more communities out there. Twitter was starting to come up and there's all these other ways right. to socialize around sports. And it's not the battle I wanted to fight. I was able to prove that I could build something that was the original goal. I created a community where people today are still friends with each other from the site. People got married from, the, you know. Cool. It was cool, cool, right? I don't want to try to drag it through the mud and try to make it yeah. something it wasn't. Yeah. So um, when you were winding that part of your life down, what was starting to fire up? So I was approached uh, by an individual who said, you know, I see what you're doing here with all these big sites. You're driving a lot of uh, community. You're doing a lot of tech that can scale. We've got an idea that we want to work with. So a major corporation wanted um, somebody to come in and kind of change how they do things in 2000, yeah. right? How do we take phone calls, how do we work with um, the whole purchasing system. So this corporation actually sent all their product out of Stillwater, Minnesota hmm. to restaurants and things all around the country. Yeah. And so I wrote this program from scratch that allowed every phone call to come in to be logged. And the moment that the order came in for the product was something spit out in the warehouse. In 2000, 2001, that didn't happen. Right. So we were, I think, the 15th or 16th person ever to connect to UPS through remote wow. connections and to be able to spit out a label right after an order and get that stuff out the door. Um, so we did that for a couple of years and that system ran for 14, 15 years really? before it got replaced, which yeah. is crazy. Crazy. Cause that doesn't happen usually. But from that experience, that's when some other individuals said, Oh, you can actually build big commercial systems or secure data things. How would you like to do some work to solve problems in the food supply yeah. in the food sector? Yeah. And I'm like, why are you asking me? Yeah. I'm just a dude from Stillwater. Like, right, and I'm supposed to build a national platform. Yeah. So it was a lot of that kind of idea of being a goalie. Like, well, you know what? I can stick it out there. I can put my face out there and and give it a shot. And this yeah. was like 2003, 2004. 
So th- is that the business that you started then that you have now? Yeah. And it's just continually evolved. Yeah, it has. So I got to tell you, man, like I've talked to you a handful of times. You're a, a C9 member, so I've got to know you that way. I still have no idea. What, like, I don't even know how to explain <laughs> right. what you do. So <clears throat> in as layman's terms as possible, because I think I have a general, like pretty good understanding of, right. of tech in general. Right. I just think what you do is so fascinating from not only the tech side, but I just think the government aspect of things is right. so nebulous that you are combining a, 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 a solution for the government Right. using your tech, and I just don't even know how to explain it. So I'm going to let you fire away. Right. So one of the key issues is that the government is, you know, they don't like to share information naturally. The USDA, FDA, these agencies don't have internet connections where they can share a lot of information. And they certainly do not between state, locals, territories, military, academics. And so it was asked of me, can you build some technology that will glue all this together mm-hmm. so we can share data, we can plan for events in the food supply, we can write regulatory regulatory you know, changes, can we respond to events? So they said, basically, can you build us a system in which all of us can centralize in one location, a secure location, and share this information we can't do today? Because that would revolutionize food and ag, because it was all paper and pencil. They're faxing things back and forth. You know, faxes never got dealt with, right? It was this is kind of revolutionary to say, we're gonna take all you folks who don't want to share data and convince you to do so. And so we basically created a one of the early versions of a cloud platform. Um, Really? The government saw fit or was in a weird time in their lives willing to take a risk on a company out of Stillwater, Minnesota, store their data not in government servers, but in infrastructure that we built. So That's... that was a crazy... I remember I went to my... my I was living with my buddy in an apartment. I took the map out on the wall. I started putting pins in it. And I'm like, I'm going to take a data center here, here, here. And I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah, right. Like, who can do this? It's like a weird... It's like, it's like out of a movie. Yeah, I'm like, this is not going to work. Right. But... You know, I, a lot of late nights and all these things, I built, wrote the software. So even the software running today, I wrote the first lines of code for. You did. And I've got a lot of staff writing code, but it's kind of this great feeling to go up and speak in front of an audience and say, we created the, kind of the one-stop shop for data sharing and response for the mm. food and egg sector. And so we work with a lot of laboratories around the country. We work with a lot of regulatory agencies. We're starting to work with industry. And we're branching out of government now. Mm. So we're starting oh. to work with private commercial medium-sized firms that have similar problems. They've got a lot of locations. They don't have a way to aggregate and uh, normalize their data like we can do for them. So you're just taking that same concept that you gave to the government, yeah. that you worked on with the government, and now you're applying it to private sector. Yeah. So right. basically, we call it secure digital workspaces, right? Mm-hmm. So we operate at a very high level of security and the requirement of the government, but we're bringing that to the commercial sector so they're not using public cloud services. Hmm. So their data is not in Doodle. You know, over right. here and over here and over here. It's right. All these services are wrapped under one umbrella where they control their data and they don't need to use third-party public clouds anymore. So how do you address... Um, so just, I think cybersecurity has, has changed so drastically and it seems to be evolving. Yeah. How does what you do address that aspect of, of things that is so complicated? Yeah, and now with the... <laughs> advent of the AI and right. The, I was and, gonna, I was going to ask that. I didn't even know if I wanted to go down that rabbit yeah, hole. Well, people teaching AI how to write malware. Right. Make the threat landscape is changing dramatically. Yeah. And a part of what I love about IT is the idea that you don't stop learning. There's always a new challenge every day. So somebody like me who doesn't mind stepping out there and on a ledge mm-hmm. and well, I'm going to go down this route. So what we need to do is prove that we could build compliance solutions. So the federal government has all these standards that you know you must apply to, and usually only the big firms can do it. Yeah. But we were able to, as a small firm to prove that by judicious use of technology, plugging the right thing in the right spots, that we could be as secure or more secure than some of the big firms who have too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Yeah, right, right. So we, you know, cybersecurity is an evolving target at all times. It's cops and robbers. Like we will note that we'll have more attacks over the holidays. So my Christmases are ruined all the time because they think nobody's watching the store. Like right. that was a thing for like 10 years. Really? Now they kind of attack all the time, but yeah, they used right. to target us when they thought we weren't there. <laughs> so. That's, that's so like just stereotypical, right? Like yeah. everyone's just having Christmas dinner. We're going to go after them now. Yeah, and all of a sudden the alarms start going on, bing, bing, bing. Yeah, Everybody's right. like, really? I'm yeah. like, come on. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to eat some turkey here. Right. Uh, so, um, so now applying what you've done to, pr- so how can someone who's listening to this 
why would they want to engage with you? So like be a little bit specific on like yeah, what, what I even like your value prop, I guess. Well, right. So what we're doing is we're, if you think about just our most recent client hire, they were still doing a lot of things in paper-based trails. They were using third-party public clouds. And when they're doing clinical trial data, for example, right, that's not a good space to be in, still mm-hmm. doing things on paper. Mm-hmm. So they really wanted to focus on electronic data capture. They weren't as interested of our community piece and to be able to glue third parties together. They wanted to glue their own internal operations together that were in multiple locations across the country and in other locations around the world. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a good way to manage all this data. Sweet. So they said, here's all of our paper-based forms. Can you digitize these? Can you make them secure like you do for the government at that level and provide the nimbleness that IBM cannot? Hmm. Right. So how can we uh, become malleable around their requirements of the workflow? So the software that we wrote is focused on working around an organization's processes versus you having to bend your organization to traditional software. Totally get it. Yeah. Um, so where does the what does the future hold for for your company? I don't think we've even said the name of your company. Oh, so Data Stream Connection. Data Stream Connection. Yeah. Right. yeah. Stillwater, okay. Minnesota. Stillwater, Minnesota. <laughs> right. Like yeah. yeah. Drive that home. The kind of the, the DNA for our company is about building better communities, right? And so we've been working in oncology spaces. We've kind of branched out into other work. Um, we do a lot of community support. And what we're really thinking about is how do we expand that model outside of just food and ag? Mm-hmm. Um, we've been asked to bring this to other continents, other countries who are struggling with their own internal IT infrastructure around regulatory bodies. You know, how do we make the food supply safe in yeah. a country in Africa? So we're working with other uh, foundations trying to bring that work out there and kind of internationalize what we're doing. Um, but we've been asked to, to step into the cannabis space. Uh, yeah, They have the same need to manage laboratories, manage regulatory data, and the interface between industry and regulators. Yeah, It's a mess right now. Fascinating. So how could we take that model we built in Food and Ag and drop that in there? Yeah, There's a lot of people in that space right now you know, doing things, but we've got the only front-to-back solution from verifying the food's good or the product is good mm-hmm. to the regulators, to the industry, that all could work together. So we're looking to kind of get out of, not get out of, but move beyond just the food and ag sector. Where do you, um, as CEO and owner of this business, where do you spend most of your time? Not on the beach. Wasn't it the promise? Yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> if you have a company, you'll just be hanging see, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You came in hot even with like your laptop and like things were, were, were going a little crazy. I know that. We won't get into details of that. But like yeah. it seems to me like you're always kind of at an arm's length of what's happening in the business. But I think you have to be forced to think strategic and, and long term. You do. And, you know, especially if you've built something, a lot of business owners are in this position. It's, it's your baby a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. That software is something I started. Yeah. And I, so I do keep my fingers in the pie a little bit, but it's been a growth of learning to step away from that, um, have my operations managers and other folks be more responsible for that and me to think more long-term, where are we going to go as a company? Yeah. And that's a shift for us because for so long, you're so invested in that space and trying to create that culture change and get that data freely flowing to solve yeah. problems, make our communities healthier, Yeah, that you kind of forget as a business owner that you've got to step away. Yeah. Um, so that's been a great thing for me over the last nine months to a year where I've been able to you know, working with the Coalition 9 group that I'm with, yeah. say, how do I step back? How okay. do I think up here instead of in my business? Yeah. So a, a couple things, and, and, and in tying in with that, uh, I want to touch on your family and so your, yeah. your personal side of things. So tell me a little bit about your personal side, your family. Like, what do you guys like to do, that kind of stuff? So uh, three kids, mm-hmm. which means um, we had three kids in 21 months. So my oldest oh. and then twins. So we went from not knowing what we're doing to overwhelmed oh my gosh. in a very short amount of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but they're all involved in sports. They're involved in a lot of school things. So if you'd imagine right. that my kids might be involved in a lot of things. Shocker. <laughs> yeah. So, but they're great. They participate in a lot of my charity efforts and the, some of the things you know, that we've started for charity, um, some of the things we've participated in. They're in hockey and soccer. You know, they're in school activities. And so it's very busy. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, we like to travel a lot. And oh, like my youngest son, the boy twin, he loves going to the mountains, and my daughter loves going to the beach, and yeah. my oldest son likes going here and there. So they all have their things. We just were in Spain yeah, for soccer, right. so my boy has got an invite to go train at FC Barcelona in Spain. Crazy. So yeah, so the, that is a lot of fun. So that was a time for just me and the boys. Yeah, I just went over there and spent time, and so they've kind of learned that you know when I grew up, we traveled basically to the mountains, and I learned the love of the mountains, but that and that's what I knew. 
they're getting to see a broader perspective of the world. And their mom like lived in Spain, traveled when she was in college and stuff. So I wanted them to have that same experience to grow up seeing that worldview that she had. Yeah. Versus I kind of knew the mountains and Apple yeah. Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah right. And that's not a dig. It's right, just, right. that's just kind of our family really loved hiking yeah. and going to the mountains. And I wanted to give them a broader palette. And you alluded to this uh, multiple times throughout this conversation, but then even just with your kids, like community and giving back is a big part of your DNA and who you are. Even right. talking about you know the Purple Pride thing, building community in that way, but I think you've translated a lot of those efforts into into um, into the work that you're doing from a charity standpoint. And I feel like you've got your hands on a lot of different stuff. So rattle off a few of the things that you are involved with and how you help uh, bolster up the community. Yeah, so we were a part of the bringing the World Snow Sculpting Championship to Stillwater, Minnesota. So teams from around the world come to Stillwater. And so I was a part of the original steering committee that helped bring that to light. And it's weird to be in our third year this year. So if you come out to Stillwater, you're going to see some amazing, like I had no idea what snow sculpting was until we did this. Yeah. And so I built the mobile app for the event and did all the IT infrastructure for it and had a highly successful event, so much so that the the artists themselves can't wait to come back to Stillwater, Sweet. Minnesota. So we're bringing international attention to our little community. Yeah, um, I'm part of the leadership in the Valley where we take leaders in around the St. Croix Valley and bring them through a program to help them reach the next level. And that's what I went through to help figure out how to get involved in the city. Right. Um, I'm a part of the city of Stillwater Planning Commission. Um, you know, and there's all these other things that I'm doing in the town, but the whole part of that is Stillwater is a great community. There's a great set of leaders down there now, and I think the Chamber of Commerce has done a lot of wonderful work there. And people like me can see that and find ways to plug in. Yeah, cool. Um, it helps me feel like I'm doing something. I want my kids to grow up and seeing their dad involved and how you can make an impact because they are smart and good kids. And if they have that direction, they can go out and make an impact themselves. Love it. All right. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, one thing I love doing is nine questions because it gives people a little bit of an insight Ooh, into you. All right. Yeah, let's get you sweating a little <laughs> bit. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we're going to take a quick break. We're going to listen to a few of our community supporters, and we're going to come right back with nine questions with Eric. When you think of a typical CPA firm, you probably think of tax planning. Well, that just scratches the surface of what Boulay offers their clients. By providing smart, in-depth thinking from experts in accounting, audit, tax, and business consulting, they know what it takes to achieve financial success. Whether it's protecting your business, building your wealth, or securing your future, you can count on Boulay to go beyond addressing just financial matters and providing you with tailor-made, workable solutions. Learn about all they have to offer at BouletGroup.com. Boulay, helping you get there. Every year brings new challenges for Minnesota business leaders, and USI Insurance is here to take the pressure off of the employee benefits decision. Having a local presence with national resources, USI combines a client-centric culture with leading-edge technical resources so you can make an informed decision on your benefits investment. The USI team has been deeply committed to investing into our local communities and utilizes their expertise to provide solutions you can count on to protect your greatest asset your employees. USI has been partnering with Twin Cities businesses for decades and they would welcome the opportunity to do the same for you. Visit USI.com to learn how USI's approach to risk management and employee benefits delivers customized, actionable solutions with bottom line impact. All right, everybody needs a bank. Not just any bank, a good community bank. From personal needs like checking and savings accounts to business services like financing and M&A support, the team at Flagship Bank is there to provide you with the assistance you need so you can spend less time thinking about your finances and more time enjoying what your money can do for you. To learn more, head over to Flagship Banks, that's Flagship Banks with an S, dot com. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Flagship Bank, investing in you. For more than 20 years, Kaisa has been the trusted financial advisor for women, business owners, executives, and high net worth families, developing financial plans designed to meet them where they are and propel them to where they want to be. Their mission is to remove the worry and stress associated with financial planning and replace it with clarity and confidence. The Kaisa team takes the time to understand each client's unique situation, from financial concerns to the visions that they have for current and future generations, in order to create a truly customized plan. Through consistent communication and personal attentiveness, Kaisa is fiercely devoted to personal well-being and financial prosperity. Get to know the Kaisa team and how they can serve you at kaisawealth.com. 
Regardless if you're a startup just figuring things out or a medium-sized organization with a full team, having a legal partner by your side is crucial. Siler Law is fiercely loyal to their clients and are passionate about removing headaches and roadblocks that can pop up during the growth of your business. Whether you need general outside counsel, are planning a business transaction, or even need someone to guide you through the estate planning process, the team at Siler Law are the advocates for you. Visit SilerLaw.com to learn more. Siler Law, where experience meets pragmatism. In addition to the community supporters you heard from on the show today, I also want to give a quick shout out to our evolving level community supporters, Carlson Partners, Fluid Interiors, Keystone Group International, Modern Foundation, and Rev Advisory Group. All right. We're back. Nine questions. Uh, Do I need some water Uh, here? You might want to take a drink. (laughs) So some people get nervous about this. I promise I I took it easy. Uh, Can you confirm to me you have no idea what I'm about to ask you? I actually do not have any idea. All right, good. I have the sheet in front of me here, so you could sneak a peek, but I'm not going to let you. No. All right. What is one guilt? One is what is one guilty pleasure that you indulge in? Oh my gosh! Can I have a couple? Yeah. <laughs> no, Whatever I think. Whatever you want to do. I don't know. I I love deep diving into some really just off the wall shows. Like yeah, give me an example. Just, um, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Oh yeah. You know. Uh, Letter Kenny, like these shows. That oh, are I love Letter of, Kenny. Yeah, I mean, there's people who are like, oh, that's just crude and stuff. I don't know if it's necessarily a guilty pleasure, but something like just getting into that. Yeah. Then getting online and joining all the Instagram groups and oh, all yeah. these things, yeah. Reddit. I, um, it's a, it's a, a way to get away from it all, but it also is like, those guys are so subversive but smart. I know. It's so much fun. The writing on both of those shows is a f- fantastic. I'm a fan of both of those shows. Yeah, and I'm... Yeah. And I listen to their podcast, you know, the whole nine yards. Yeah. So yeah, it, that's not guilty per se, I guess, but it is just something that's just I, fun and way out of my normal, like yeah. buttoned up guy yeah. going to work, right? Yeah, I'm with <laughs> you. Like sometimes I, I, if I meet somebody like you that I never would have thought that you like Letter Kenny, there's a weird, like it is crude and the, the shit they say is, is a little, is a lot so, off the especially wall. It's always but there's some really good, oh yeah, that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> but there's some good messages in that, right? And they, you know, they're, they're not, they're not all that they're cracked up to be. But I do think that there, it helps me. Actually, I even kind of look at you a little differently now that you right. like di- Letter Kenny. I'm like, man, I freaking dig this. Right. Yeah, yeah. So now I can throw some one liners at you every once Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you get yeah. it, right? We'll know. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Special kinship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Number two, uh, if you could give a TED talk on anything except something related to your career, what would it be? Uh, the power of community, hmm. the power of people. Hmm. I think that the untapped potential that too many of us get in our heads and think of very linearly where we're at. Yeah. Wish there was more, but don't know how to do it. Yeah. I, and, that and I used to be that way. Yeah. And I think, um, you and I could probably riff on that forever. Like we right. might even want to have a whole nother podcast episode just on the building of community, because I think, you know, that's what I love about C9 is that it is a little community, but yet it has so much impact broader than that right. too on the lives that people. And I think all those different stories that you've talked about through your career has a hundred percent had a positive. You talk about people getting married from right. being a part of the purple pride thing. Like right. that's epic. Right. Yeah. And C9 is a really special community that way too. And that's why I love being a part of it. Yeah, man. I appreciate yeah. that. All right. Um, oh, describe the perfect sandwich. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> people say that I eat like a toddler. Oh, so, interesting. This is fast. So I like, <laughs> right. I like right. just things straight up, ready to go. I don't need to dial it up with 25 different things. So you throw me up a club sandwich, you know, something like that. Yeah. But it has to be spicy. You got to throw some spice on it. You spice on everything. So I, I, so guilty pleasure, right, is bread because I'm trying to be healthy and yeah, right. I eat all that stuff. I so love bread. Talk about guilty pleasure and a sandwich all together here. Yeah. I'm getting happy. Yeah. So yeah. anything meat and cheese with a hot sauce in it and some bread. Really? And I'm good to go. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm easy. All right. That's, that's what I say. You don't have to cook that's, for me. That's just decent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love sandwiches. I go, I love bread. Oh, I go all day on that. Right. Um, okay. A r- would you rather question? Uh, would you rather hear a comforting lie or an uncomfortable truth? I tend to fall on the side of I'd rather know than not know. Yeah. And so even if it's uncomfortable, I'd rather have the issue broached. Deal with it. Um, yeah. I mean, I from my background, I you know I. I will seek to understand why that's the opinion, but I'd like to know, yeah. right? I think that's the easiest way to go through life. I mean, I can bury my head in my sand for a lot of things, but I'd rather know and just have that conversation. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss, but I, I, um, I would prefer not to be ignorant. Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. What is one quality in a person that impresses you? Wow. Um, one quality, if I had to choose one, 
I think ambition is the wrong word because some people give the wrong connotation to that. But people who are driven right. and seek to be engaged, mm -hmm. right? Those are really, I'm really technically an introvert, but I do a lot of extroverted things. And mm -hmm. I tend to find people like that who are driven, kind of get out of their shell a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that always really impresses me with, with folks that they're willing to step outside that bounds and get over that hump a little bit yeah. and really push themselves. You got some, uh, yourself included, you got some pretty driven people in your C9 group right. that is like, that's the kind of people that probably, why you keep coming back is that those are the people that you're attracted to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, those people in my group are amazing. I dig it. Um, okay, uh, what is one thing on your bucket list? Oh, um, you know, I love, I talk about, I love experiences. So I do a lot of things for experiences. And one thing I have not done yet Um would probably be visiting uh, Eastern Europe. Oh. I'd love to go check that out because I've done a lot in Europe and I've been to Africa, whatever, but I've not been to that part of the country. And my grandma, we have this little bit of Polish. I'm and Polish, she, And yeah. she said, oh, it's Prussian. Yeah. But I really want to go back to where some of our ancestors were there and check that out because it looks like it's a beautiful country. Yep. And that would be just really empowering. Because like, I've been to Ireland. I know all of our Irish history. I know our German side. Very little information about the Prussian side, but I guess it's a specific area. Yeah. So that I uh, did that that ancestry thing too, and and my on my dad's side, my dad always thought that he was German and Polish 50-50. Mm -hmm. We'll come to find out he's a hundred percent Polish because they really dialed it into a specific spot in Poland. Right. And it's Prussia, right? Yeah, like that's it, what it is. It's yeah. all it's so it's kind of a really it, like I'm with you 100 percent on that. Like Poland and Norway are two areas that I'm really fascinated with. Right. Um, but I'm with you on that. Yeah, I'd love to be able to have a chance to go do that. All right, cool. Good bucket list item. Um, what or where is your go-to for creative inspiration? <laughs> um, the mountains. So imagine yeah, that. Can I grew up going there. Yeah. yeah. So when I travel, I'll tend to do a day or two on what or a day on each side or something like that. So if I go to Denver, I'm up in Estes Park in the mountains. I go up to twelve thousand feet up in the Trail Ridge Road and just cool. sit mm. in the quiet. In silence. Right. Yeah. Or I go to Banff. I've been to Banff mm. a lot of times. Um, grew up going there. Love that space. But I go there and I can spend three days, be more recharged than if I took a month vacation at home. I love it. Right. Yeah. So just finding that spot where it speaks to me. Um, and I can sit and just take copious amounts of notes. I do a year of planning in a day. I love it. Yeah. yeah it's, it, there's something special about finding those places like that that just give that. It's such a, like an infusion yeah. that you need. And, and I get those in certain areas too. And it's just, it's, it's, it, there's, it's unmatched. Well, in the business, you're running so hard all the time and you're, and you're a lot of times serving other folks and mm -hmm. you forget to serve yourself. Mm -hmm. And those are the times I'm saying, I'm going to be selfish mm -hmm. and I'm going to take these extra days here. And the kids understand. I said, you know, I just need a little bit of time. Um, it, you know, as long as everybody's dialed in and on board with it, that makes me feel good about going and doing it. Yeah. All right. Um, your, your other would you rather question, would you rather always say everything on your mind or never speak again? <laughs> so think I, about the repercussions. Yeah. That's, I don't think I could be silent forever. <laughs> so I'd have to go with speak in my mind. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, uh, part of that thing too is being, knowing how to express yourself, how to be tactful when you do speak your mind. Those are qualities I really, um, admire in folks because mm -hmm. I know a lot of folks who don't. Yeah. Um, and I wish they would quiet down. <laughs> <laughs> Dial it back a notch. Right, but yeah, yeah. yeah, I do definitely like the, uh, speaking your mind part. Yeah. Uh, all right. Last one. All this right. wasn't so bad. Ah. Uh, what is one thing people often get wrong about you? I, kind of back to that I'm really actually kind of introvert I, I'm not good at networking I don't like going out like going to networking groups yeah. I'm scared to death of that like yeah. meeting people and trying to explain my really weird niche business to them it's like yeah. and so people think I'm an extrovert because I'm involved in all these things I just love to be the center of attention I love being the goalie but you know yeah I like doing some of that stuff but I'd much rather kind of hang at home and do things and I think that's what surprises people that I I write a lot um, I've had public poetry published I've you know written for USA Today on, on sports stuff and my photography has been published right like I have that creative side you know they all think I'm just out running all the time it's like yeah. no I like doing these like little introspective things yeah, yeah you know I think that's what I love about this podcast is be able to amplify people that 
that their stories aren't told. And there's so many different things about you that you just said a couple of things that you, that I'd never heard come out of your mouth or poetry and some of that other stuff. Right. And that's the magic of relationships of getting to know people and digging in. Like we're right. just, we're just scratching the surface here. The more time I spend with you, I find you fascinating. So, um, that's what I love about this is now giving people opportunity to connect with you and get to know right. you a little bit. And if you're up for it, like, um, share with, share with our listeners how they can get a hold of you and how they can get to know you. And, and you've, you got a lot to give. Well, absolutely. And I'm, again, I love making connections, especially this type of manner, which we're already a little bit introduced to each other. Yeah, like yeah. you know a little bit about me, it makes yep. it more comfortable for me. So, yep. but definitely um, I'm all over, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, I give my email address or whatever typically you all do. Yeah, if you, that's what you want to do. I put in, I put everything in the show notes. Is it in there? That you want, yep. So, yeah. You, yeah, so uh, you can go ahead and say it. Yep. Uh, and then I'll put it, all the stuff that you want. And I, I actually give a couple of links of, of not only your business, but like some of the things that you're involved in. Yeah. So I would say um, you can get a hold of me at ehoffman at dscxn.com. Yep. That's why I was saying you can put that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah I will. Data Stream Connection is a very long URL. For yeah, I like that type. nice short one. <laughs> Um, but I definitely uh, encourage people to look at golfforthegift.org. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is where one of our charities we're raising money for adoption. Cool. Um, and I'll give you a couple other links to put in the show notes, but some yeah. of those sites that we, um, those charities that we're involved with, uh, uh, hunger-related events is something where we do a lot of events where we're raising money for hunger relief in the Twin Cities. Sweet. So. You know, um, it's, it's, like I said, it's fascinating to always hear people's stories. And, and, you know, a community is great because it's so many different experiences and journeys and personalities and things like that. And it means a lot for me to have you be, be a part yeah. of Coalition 9 and, and be on our podcast and, me, Absolutely. you know, you coming as an introvert, uh, being able to come and just kind of lay it on the line a little bit. It was great to get a little bit of yeah. insight into you, man. All right. Absolutely. I appreciate coming on here. This is a, a great. If you ever want to just break down community and all those yeah, things right. at some point, we should do it. I would love to do that sometime. Absolutely. All right. I mean, we can just even do it off uh, off air. We can just do it over lunch or something like that too. No, absolutely. All right. Good, man. <laughs> uh, on behalf of Eric, this has been the Power of Nine podcast. I'm your host, Eric Eggert, and I want to thank you for the privilege of your time.